This is the web transmission service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On February the 25th, the Institute hosted our annual joint dinner with Fort York Branch 165 Legion. We were honored to be addressed by General Walt Natinchik, former Chief of Defence Staff and now serving as Deputy Minister for Veterans Affairs Canada. So thank you very much, and I welcome now General Lachinchuk to speak with you. Thank you so much. And Mike, don't worry about the rank. You can just call me Walt from Winnipeg, and that would work out, okay? Can everybody hear me? George told me not to shout. <laughs> Uh, listen, it's uh, it's a real honor to be uh, to be back here, uh, and it's been it's been a few years. It's been five years, and I still remember uh, Gill was president at the time, uh, January two thousand and five. Uh, sorry, twenty fifteen that we were here, and um, you want me to lower my voice just a little bit? Okay. Or do you want me to walk around? Can you hear me this way? over his camera <laughs> okay listen it's an honor to be here and I just want to uh, first express my appreciation for this opportunity to be here amongst friends amongst family uh, with uh, this very happy marriage uh, between RCMI and the Royal Canadian Legion uh, and the Fort York Legion George was just telling me about this and I'm understanding it's a virtual legion no bricks and mortar there, but does an extraordinary job. And, and but what a wonderful, wonderful partnership that is here uh, in around this room. And having known some of you over the past decades, uh, to thank you personally for what you provide to veterans, to those who still serve, and Dwayne, thank you so much for being here, um, but what you provide this community, uh, an, extraordinary, an extraordinary community. Um, I am here again for the first time since 2015. In 2015, when Gill hosted, uh, it, at the time, was newly minted Veterans Affairs Minister, uh, Aaron O'Toole, who had been in the job for two weeks. <laughs> and at that time, I was a newly minted uh, Deputy Minister, having been in this file for two months. But let me just say, first of all, that I was shocked that I was into this role. Uh, like many of you who wore the uniform for a long time, I really looked forward to retirement. Didn't you? You look forward to retirement, you know, whether you were aboard ship or making a repair in the bush somewhere, uh, or if you were uh, on, on the flight line and you're having a bad day, you dreamed of retirement. Or back in NDHQ or any one of the command headquarters, you, you know, you get really frustrated, budget cuts or whatever, and you say, I need to get the heck out of here. I want to retire. And uh, I realized that uh, two months after I took off the uniform, only two months after the, the uniform, I realized something nobody tells you. Nobody tells you when you're wearing a uniform. Retirement's overrated. <laughs> <laughs> Retirement's overrated. <laughs> because the moment you retire, your whole family knows you have time on your hands and they ask you to do stuff so they can go on holiday. <laughs> so I want to paint this picture to, for you here. Two months after I retire as Chief of Defense Staff in command of basically 100,000 Reg Reserve, the Rangers, the Cadets, you name it, it's February in Ottawa, minus 25 degrees, Saturday morning, 0700, and I'm walking three dogs, none of which are mine. <laughs> and as I'm bending over to pick up another pile of, you know what? A neighbor who I love stuck her head out of the back door and said, Oh, how the mighty have fallen. <laughs> <laughs> I went back to my sweetie, bringing a coffee to her in the morning and said, Hey, babe, I gotta do something. 
this every day is Saturday wears off pretty quickly. <laughs> and so, just so you know, and in sharing with all of you, because I didn't share this when I was here five years ago, is that before I, uh, when I was in uniform and Chief of Defense, I would have quarterly meetings with the Prime Minister. I would give an update on what's happening in Afghanistan, what's happening in whether it be Haiti or any of the other operations, how we're doing in terms of a, uh, support to our troops and buying equipment and so on, give an update. One of the last meetings he said, uh, so what are you going to do after you retire? And I said, well, you know, I've got a few offers and I'll probably pursue that. But I said, you know, the job that I would really like to do is the Deputy Minister of Veterans Affairs. That's the job I want to do. And he said, why is that? I said, I'm not satisfied with how our soldiers, our sailor soldiers, airmen and women are being cared for. And I'm holding folks in the Canadian Armed Forces because I'm worried about the care for them when they take off the uniform. And so I wasn't surprised when seven, seven months later, every day is Saturday, and I'm walking a lot of dogs, <laughs> I get a phone call and they say, okay, we want you to do something. I said, terrific, I'm ready. They said, we want you to be the president of the Canadian Space Agency. <laughs> I went, space. <laughs> space. I said, you know, I've got a degree. It's all framed up. It says business administration. But in reality, I've got a degree in rugby and football. <laughs> <laughs> and so here I got hired on as the president of the Canadian Space Agency. And my gosh. We have brilliant engineers and scientists. Brilliant. But for me, every day coming in was a shock for them. Because it was like, if you've seen this TV show, Big Bang Theory, every day was another episode of Big Bang Theory. And if you've seen the show, I'm like Penny. <laughs> okay, don't let your imaginations go too wild. Here, now. Okay. Keep it, keep it, keep it played here. <laughs> Eric, you got this camera running here or what? Yep. <laughs> but I tell you what, in, uh, in, November, in October of 2014, I got a call saying, uh, we want you to go to Veterans Affairs. Move now out. I had one week's notice. I had one week's notice and I went to Veterans Affairs. And what I found was a perfect storm. It was a perfect storm. And when I came here five years ago, I was still doing an assessment of that perfect storm. And the perfect storm was the reality that our troops were coming home from Afghanistan, injured both physically and mentally. The new Veterans Charter, and I'm sure many of you are au fait with that, it had come into being in 2006 and there were shortcomings in that plan, big shortcomings, that had not yet been addressed. And then as a result of the economic uh, downturn, the Department of Veterans Affairs had been reduced by 35 to 40 percent. 35 to 40 percent in terms of people and resources. And I would also say to you, what's unique about the Department of Veterans Affairs is it is the only national department with the headquarters outside of Ottawa. Outside of Ottawa. The headquarters of Veterans Affairs is in Charlottetown. And many of you I know would, would holiday out in Charlottetown. Veterans Affairs is the biggest employer on Prince Edward Island. And the shock of going from 2,000 folks to 1,100 folks in Charlottetown with a population of only 30,000 folks was huge. And you have all of this coming together in a perfect storm. And that's the kind of environment that I uh, kind of walked into. And kind of walking in from a military perspective, the first thing I was able to do is to say to the folks, hey, we'll be okay. We'll be okay. We're going to move out with a new departmental culture. It's going to be all based around care, compassion, and respect. Our mission is to care for veterans, no matter where they are. And no matter what generation they are. That when we have to default in our decision making, we're going to default to compassion. And if, and if you color outside the lines, don't worry about it. There's only one guy going to jail, and it's me. And I get to go walk dogs again. It's okay. <laughs> and finally, we will do our business with respect. We will always, always do our business with respect. We will not push back 
on veterans. They've served, they made sacrifices, they can say what they want. And I did the same thing in the Canadian Forces. That for a grieving parent or an injured soldier, if they wanted to say something, away they go. Ah, okay, it's in the media, so what? It'll blow by. But you never push back. And it was huge in terms of, of, changing, of changing that whole culture in the department as we move forward. So when I came here in 2015, as I said, it was a pretty tough time. I fast forward now five years and look back. Uh, I'm in year six now. But this past five years, uh, I would just say that when veterans are happy, they go quiet. It all goes quiet. When veterans are unhappy, oh my God, do we hear about it. And you know what I mean, especially with social media. Over these past five years, whether you've known it or not, the government of Canada, through the mandate uh, of uh, 2015, has put almost $11 billion into veteran program and benefits. That $11 billion represents almost 10% of all new spending in the government of Canada. And it's gone to veterans over all this time. It's an extraordinary investment. I kind of watch the Canadian Armed Forces to see how much they're getting. And the reality is that the funds have come in to support those veterans, go, go all the way back to World War II veterans, all the way up to those who are just uh, uh, deploying uh, now, whether it be into Iraq or anywhere else uh, in the world, or indeed someone gets hurt on basic training, a BOTC or what, what have you. We're taking care of those folks too. Today in Canada, we've got about 600,000 veterans, just over 600,000 veterans. And of those 600,000 veterans, about 120,000 of them are clients of Veterans Affairs. In addition to those veterans, both regular and reserve, we also support about 50,000 survivors. We, that is families of, of, of our fallen. In addition, we provide support to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police veterans. We support about 13,000 RCMP veterans and about 1,000 uh, RCMP survivors. And all of that comes under the uh, umbrella of the Minister of Veterans Affairs, uh, Minister Lawrence McCauley. About 2.2 million uh, folks have served in uniform. 2.2 million. That's a lot of folks. And, and all the way back to uh, the Boer War and, and forward, again, um, the government of Canada has taken care of them. But indeed, it was after World War I uh, where the, the department came together. Uh, and, I was, and I say with tongue in cheek, uh, while we're commemorating, well, last year we commemorated the, cent the, the centennial of World War I, and this year we are uh, uh, commemorating the 75th anniversary, the end of World War II. 70th anniversary of the start of the Korean War, we also recognize that we had 100 years of backlog, if you know what I mean. The backlog on all the files is about 100 years because it started in 1919. We have uh, an extraordinary record of service to our veterans through all of these, uh, all of these years. Uh, and just to say that as we compare uh, what we do with our American colleagues, and I'll be in Washington later this week, or our Australian uh, or our New, our New Zealand colleagues, we benchmark for best in practice across and for support to all of those generations across the board. And we are always making efforts in order to address and improve our, our programming. What we know is that of all of those folks who serve, uh, we have done research uh, and found that uh, about a third of folks have difficulty in their tra transition to civilian life. So every year we know that there's about seven to 9,000 men and women who release from the Canadian Armed Forces, both regular and reserve, and about a third of them have difficulty in the transition to civilian life. Two thirds of them are fine. They've had generally a, a good career. Many of them have got to senior NCO or officer ranks. Uh, they, some of them have superannuation and they're good and they move forward and, and there's no problem at all. One third have difficulty. And as we drill down on that one-third, who do we find there? For the most part, combat arms, junior ranks, short of a superannuation, 
and Navy bosuns. Those are the folks who are having str struggles. And when we drill down a little bit more, we try to figure out why are they having a difficult time? What, what is the issue? And what we've been able to do through the research that we have, been able to figure out that there are about seven domains of well-being. What keeps people uh, happy? What keeps people satisfied in that transition and a, and a change to their new normal? It's seven domains of well-being. The most important one, number one, is purpose. It's purpose. This idea, again, that every day is Saturday wears off pretty quickly. And you need to get up and you need to do something every day. You need to have purpose every day. For some folks, it might be a job. For some folks, it might be a hobby. It's not dog walking. It's got to be something that gets you up and motivates you and pushes you into tomorrow's. It's purpose. The second one is financial well-being. The third one is having medical support, adequate medical support. The fourth is having family support. And I just want to ask family members who are here today, if you could stand up and let's just recognize, if you're a, a partner or spouse in a, uh, in a veteran family or military family, can you just stand up right now? Let's give a round of applause. There you go. Family members are the first caregivers. They're always the first caregivers. We need to provide support to family. Having adequate shelter is key as a domain of well-being. Being part of a community is part of well-being. And finally, identity. Those are the seven domains of well-being. And as we drill down to that one-third of all veterans who have difficult times, we kind of roll in and say, what went wrong? And you can all actually articulate it down to one of those seven domains of well-being. So what we've been able to do in this investment that's occurred over this past uh, five years is focus the programming and focus the benefits on those domains of well-being. So with regard to purpose, we've been able to create a Canadian version of a GI Bill, of an education bill. So the education and training benefit now provide support in terms of tuition, books, and living expenses. If you've done six years of service or 12 years of service, respectively $40,000 and $80,000 so that folks can go off and, and get back into school. Or if you're like me and you joined the Army because you hated school, you can also get $5,000 to learn a hobby. Whether you want to make golf clubs, or you want to learn how to sail, or you want to become a sommelier. But you, know, you can actually do things in order to gain purpose. We've created a career transition service. So that, and we've done it online, so that I've heard of veterans, they apply at 8 o'clock in the morning, and by 9 o'clock they have an answer, and they're good to go. We go through uh, a career uh, counseling and job placement. But it's to have purpose. We've created, as we move this Pension for Life initiative, as part of one of the uh, long-term disability income replacement benefits, we actually allowed veterans to earn $20,000 on their own uh, without any clawback on that income replacement benefit in order to incentivize purpose. Get them out of the basement, stop playing Xbox or watching the Netflix, and get moving with purpose. So we've kind of focused it right there. In terms of financial security, we brought in this new pension for life. Veterans were telling us it's too complex. There's too many benefits. Bring it together. We've simplified it. We consolidated it. We took six benefits and we brought them all into one. So make it easier on veterans. Uh, and we've benchmarked it so that someone who is going through uh, treatment, whether it be vocational, uh, sorry, uh, addiction treatment or mental health treatment, physical treatment, or, or vocational rehabilitation, is getting 90% of their pre-release income, and that's indexed. And we set a floor, so especially if there's a young private or officer cadet who gets hurt on basic training, there's a floor that gets them into the middle class. It provides financial security. In terms of medical support, again, increasing the support for mental health, the operational stress injury clinics, access to 4,000 mental health service providers coast to coast to coast through Blue Cross, MetaV, uh, and indeed we have over 4,000 veterans in long-term care and had a great discussion about Sunnybrook today. Great facility here. 
But we are supporting over uh, 4,000 veterans in over 1,100 facilities coast to coast to coast. Uh, we've created this, or we've supported the Canadian Institute of Military and Veteran Health Research that is uh, connecting the web of 30 Canadian universities coast to coast, their research arms in order to up the game of all of the practitioners coast to coast to coast, uh, set up a center of excellence for mental health and PTSD in Ottawa, the Royal Ottawa, and setting up a center of excellence for chronic pain at the DeGroot Center here in Hamilton. Uh, part of McMaster University, but all around this notion of medical support. For family support, brought in a caregiver recognition benefit for those uh, veterans who rely on a, on a caregiver to recognize those who step up and as a result of feedback from families that benefit is paid right to the caregiver and does not go through the veteran. And as of a, a budget or two ago, now families or military families uh, who transition uh, into retirement uh, but are medically released have access, enduring access, to the 32 military family resource centers across the country. All of that to ensure that the families are resilient. I could go on and on here, I'll stop uh, in, in a few moments, but I do want to hit on the point about identity. And the reality is we've now brought back together this uh, veteran ID card. Some of you might have it now. And uh, get your luggage on free there with WestJet and Air Canada and Via Rail and so on. But all of that is to enable well-being. It's not about the dollars and cents. We tend to focus on the dollars and cents. The dollars and cents don't get you health. What gets you health is having purpose having support around, and that's what's so wonderful here in this ring. My uh, final message to you is one about mental health. This is a real problem, and we are, we are moving forward to the best that we can, but the reality is stigma still exists with regard to mental health. Uh, again, when I benchmark with what the Americans are doing, the Australians are doing, the Brits or the Kiwis, we're doing pretty well, but it's not perfect. One of, the as one of the aspects for me when I was in uniform and today I want to make the point of is, is while uh, treatment of mental health is in the medical domain, addressing the stigma is a leadership responsibility. Leadership responsibility. And leaders need to talk about it in order to create a safe environment so if folks are struggling they feel safe to come forward and start the treatment. The sooner you, you, you start the treatment, uh, the better you get and you get back in the saddle. And when I was still in uniform, I would tell the story of, uh, of uh, my return on leave while I was serving with the U.S. military uh, in Iraq. And again, I do uh, apologize for my accent. It's kind of a mixed up accent. I spent a year, again, with uh, 150,000 Texans uh, and others in Iraq. And so uh, I've got a bit of a Texas twang, both in English and in French. So <laughs> bonjour, y'all. <laughs> But the, the story I tell is um, on uh, Easter weekend of uh, 2004, uh, it was 9th of April, uh, I was living in Baghdad behind uh, one of Saddam Hussein's palaces and the rockets just came in. The rockets just came into our area and we're just living in these little tin shacks and I couldn't make it to the bunker, so it was put on your helmet, put on your flak jacket, get under the bed and hope for the best. A few months later, um, I was uh, coming home on leave, my first leave, and God bless my wife Leslie, uh, because uh, the, uh, General Hillier had told me I'd be posted back to Ottawa uh, after, oh, sorry, back to Kingston, Ontario after my tour. So my wife Leslie packed up the family and on her own moved from Fort Hood, Texas to Kingston, Ontario. Okay, yeah, second time she's moved the family on her own. God bless her. Anyway, so th thank goodness that she was at the airport to pick me up in Kingston, Ontario, because I had no idea where we lived. <laughs> okay, so she moved the family into Kingston, Ontario. I fly into Baghdad. She's at the airport, drags me home into our house, very close to Lake Ontario. And the first night over Lake Ontario is one of those incredible thunderstorms. You know, bolt of lightning, clap of thunder. And what happens in our house? I jump out of bed, I scream, take cover! I grab her and I throw her out of the bed and I jump underneath my bed and I'm looking for my helmet, my flak jacket. 
Well, you can imagine how that went over. <laughs> she comes around to my side of the bed, she puts her hands on her hips and says, you old fool, that's a thunderstorm. <laughs> and then she says, who the hell were you sleeping with in Baghdad? The fact you threw me out of bed first. <laughs> Now, I've told that story to literally thousands of sailors and soldiers and airmen. I've told that story in Kabul, Afghanistan. I've told that story aboard HMCS Fredericton. I told that story in the bush of Gagetown and Valcarce. And in every occasion, a young soldier or sailor or airman or woman comes up to me and says, Hey, sir, that's me. That's me. And the reality is, that if people feel safe to come forward and, and are able to get help, they're able to get back in the saddle again. And that's what's just so powerful. So ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say that on behalf of the department, uh, I am absolutely thrilled to be here and to break bread with you. I am so pleased that the community of veterans, the community of those who have served, the community who's made so many sacrifices, coming here together, keeping each other healthy, I would also say that no matter where we served, whether the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, we all want to know that someone recognized what we did. I can always remember it was Christmas of 2009. I was uh, in Afghanistan with Minister McKay and, uh, uh, and a number of other uh, VIPs, and it was Christmas Eve. Uh, we were at this camp called Masamgar. We're on the top of uh, the mountain, and there's a leopard tank up there and a Strathcona sergeant who was commanding that tank. And, uh, and he looks up at the minister and I and he says, Sir, does anyone know I'm here? <laughs> I said, my gosh, you got the minister here. You got the chief of defense here. That's got to count for something. <laughs> no matter where our people are and serving, they want to know that the country recognizes them, appreciates their service, appreciates their sacrifice, and they are not forgotten, even when they take off the uniform. And that's what this is about. My last duty here, I just want to recognize someone whose name was brought forward to me who has made a significant contribution in support of veterans across the board. Uh, I'd just like to present a, a certificate of appreciation from the Minister of Veterans Affairs uh, and a coin of uh, uh, the Medallion of, of Excellence, uh, my coin, and it says care, compassion, on and respect. And Sam, if you could just come forward, you have no idea what's going on, but just come forward, Sam. Okay. Sam, this, this says Captain Samantha Roman uh, for your generous contribution, outstanding dedication to veterans uh, and the values they've served uh, to uphold. I just want to present that to you on behalf of Minister Lawrence McCauley. Go on right over here, are you okay? Totally good. Okay. You can clap now. <laughs> can I do this? There you go. Thank you. And I'm ready for questions if you wish. Thank you, sir. We will take questions. There's one right there. Uh, General, very close to here is the Good Shepherd. And I know it's close to your heart uh, that uh, Veterans Affairs stepped up big time with the homeless issue in Toronto through the Good Shepherd. I, I don't know if other people here know where it is, but they may not know the, the extent that your department has gone at the Good Shepherd. Well, thanks very much for the question. I, was, I, uh, I wanted to touch on shelter. Uh, again, over the past few years, uh, the department, with the support of, of government, provided or created a uh, veteran and family well-being fund. And the purpose of the fund is to invest in innovative ideas. And one of the areas that has been absolutely superb is supporting homeless veterans. And so uh, we, Minister McCauley was just in uh, Toronto in the past few weeks uh, and with announcement at the Shepherds of Good Hope with regard to um, an investment of just under $400,000 and again, a counseling service in support of, of veterans uh, in that regard. Uh, and again, a lot, there's a lot of veterans in this, in this city and we don't know that they're there. And having this kind of a, of, of a counseling service 
In addition to, we've created a veteran emergency fund. It's the first time that the government of Canada can actually give uh, money to an individual without having to prove their eligibility. So we can actually put a roof over their heads, put groceries on the table while we figure out who they are. Uh, and I'll just say to you, just share, use this opportunity to say I was just out in Calgary at a um, Homes for Heroes uh, that just opened up recently. Fantastic uh, community of 15 of these tiny homes. Uh, and this was supported by Atco Frontech and I think uh, PCL uh, Construction. But walking around and talking to the veterans. One veteran, Queens York Rangers, Aurora Squadron, in Calgary and getting support. Things went sideways, and there they are. Another Cal Calgary Highlander, different situation. Met a, met a young lady, radar technician. So what are you here for? And the ability to find these folks, put a roof over their heads, and then get them down the path towards well-being. That's what's happening at the Shepherds of Good Hope. Thank you so much for that question. Any other questions? Comments? Oh, well, uh, there we go. Uh, sir. Yeah. Sir. Sir. Where are you? Well, well. I'm here. Okay. Uh, I don't understand that uh, president of the space agency, but I do understand that a general, a real general in charge of the uh, deputy minister of veteran affairs. Okay, I do understand that. And from what I understand, veteran affairs has worked really good because we got a general that understands what's going on. What is going on with the Department of National Defense? We have had so many good generals go through our organization. I'm thinking of military, I'm thinking of artillery. Jeffries, Spear, uh, Bino, uh, 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 Leslie, and uh, those guys, okay? Those guys, like, why are we so screwed up in the Department of National Defense in terms of Equipment. I'll just use the equipment. Sir. I really appreciate the question, but no comment. I remember the line I used. I was out in Saskatchewan at a Canadian Forces Appreciation Night. And again, I'm a Winnipegger and a, and a, and a, a true Blue Bomber fan. And here we are being supported by the Saskatchewan folks. And as you know, being rider, rider prize, Saskatchewan Rough Riders, it runs in their family. You know, I think they get tattoos, whatever. And so I came up with a line that I want to use right now. Love the one you're with. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Oh. Yes, Mike. Sir, I understand that Veterans Affairs is becoming much more engaged, much more dealing with the real situations. There are still a lot of organizations that may have started being developed earlier for support of veterans because Veterans Affairs wasn't as engaged. How is, the, is their role still valid? What's the relationship between organizations like that and your office? Supporting veterans is all about partnerships across the country. It's all about partnerships and it's grassroots community part partnerships that are essential. I, I, and, and I just say this from the military standpoint, you can give intent at a strategic level, but it's what happens boots on the ground that's so key. You know, and I, I just want to applaud the Royal Canadian Legion, and we're doing a lot of support and cooperation with the Royal Canadian Legion. I just talked to Tom Irvine, we did our kind of uh, semi-annual meeting with the Legion, and my mission is how do I empower the Legion that has 1,200 uh, branches across the country and, and, and really the foothold and we are training the service officers in order to do business. In some parts of the country it might be Anavets, sometimes it's peacekeeping vets, sometimes it's Aboriginal vets. We, we partner with them all and in every community success is all about leadership and that's why I'm just so thrilled to be here tonight and seeing the leadership in this room. So just to say is that we are, uh, we are supporting all of them. Uh, we are uh, also funding out of that well-being fund is something called the Respect Forum, if you've heard about that. Respect Forum actually brings together all of these community organizations. I think they're going to 26 different communities. All of these different organizations supporting veterans and coming together as a community saying, are we coherent? 
Who's doing what to whom? And if there is overlap, that's okay, but do you know about it? So we're investing into community partnerships. Thank you for that question. David. General, it's amazing the support you've given to Sunnybrook as a flagship for veterans care in this country, the largest veterans care in our country. And today for you to meet with us as a task group for Fort York 165 and to give us that encouragement that we should reach out and help veterans in our community who might not know about the resources in Sunnybrook. My question to you is similar to what we discussed earlier. And I want you to share with everyone the ambition that you disclosed that has to do with expanding the role for access to not just World War II and Korean vets, but for Cold War veterans in this country. And to have the bed space not be disregarded and is available at such a flagship in this city. Thanks, David, for the question. So at this moment in time, we're supporting over 4,000 uh, veterans uh, coast to coast to coast. 1,000 of those veterans are, are what I would call post-Korea War vets, uh, where their eligibility is that they are frail, uh, they are ill or injured as a result of service. And keeping in mind that for World War II vets, Korea War vets, not all of those vets have access to great places like Sunnybrook or Pearly Rito or Camp Hill or the Lodge at Broadmead. You know, there's all kinds of rules that were kind of um, holdovers from that era. But what we've been able to do is go to government and say for those veterans who are post-Korea, who have injuries, illnesses as a result of service, under some criteria, we can get them into a facility. And I'll just say I was in Quebec City uh, a few months ago at the, um, at the long-term care facility called Maison Paul Tariquet, uh, and we have two Afghan vets there in their 50s. And I said to one fellow, you know, what's your regiment? And he says, I wasn't even in the army. And I know he's a Van Duke. <laughs> but it goes to the fact is that things have changed. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, we benchmark with what other countries are doing, and oh my gosh, Canada is generous. My gosh, Canada is generous. So Sunnybrook is a, a national uh, treasure, uh, and I know having visited there uh, at the beginning of this uh, job, they didn't think they'd have that many veterans around this long. But the reality is a lot of families have brought their loved veterans into Toronto because of the quality of care at Sunnybrook. And so I applaud the, uh, the initiative of the Royal Canadian Legion here to get the word out so that other veterans and families are out there not aware uh, of Sunnybrook or of Parkwood, of any of these facilities, uh, that they understand that their, their eligibility. Thanks, David. Mark. Uh, sir, I'm, I'm prepared to ask this question. Uh, just want to let you know, David took me as his date to the uh, Branch 165 dinner when I was an inpatient for two months in Kaneway. So I was temporary. Uh, my roommates were 192, 192 years old. They're really jealous I was the baby. <laughs> Sir, um, you've actually done a segue into a question I wanted to ask about. Um, we've got Sunnybrook in Toronto. I can spell 3RC, 3CRPG in Ontario. We've got the isolated communities up north and the Rangers. They don't have Legion branches, um, and I'm hoping to do something with 3CRPG. What about the uh, Veterans Affairs? What do you guys think in terms of helping the isolated communities in our uh, north? Uh, thanks, Mark, for the question. We actually have a roving patrol that works the Arctic. Uh, when we, when we, we uh, again, over this past few years, and part of that almost $11 billion investment, nine of the previously closed offices were reopened. We opened another office in Surrey, British Columbia, because it was underserviced. And then we created a roving patrol VAC detachment, so to speak, for the Arctic that worked the White Horse, Yellowknife, Iqaluit, you know, all these communities in the north. Uh, and so that's been created. Uh, and again, not a big profile. They go in and, and partner with the Royal Canadian Legion and, uh, you know, on set dates, we have the folks up there. And we're also trained the trainer. We're training the Royal Canadian Legion service officers as we are for Anavets, Army Navy Air Force uh, vets, the Dominion. 
in order to cover off all of those regions. I would also say to you, if you don't have one yet, here's a plug for the MyVAC account. So we're online with the MyVAC account. We now have over 100,000 veterans and family members who are MyVAC account um, holders. So if you're not on, online, consider the MyVAC account because again, we are serving folks in the hinterland. What was amazing, uh, I was at the opening uh, of our office in Prince George, British Columbia, otherwise known as PG. How many folks have been to PG? There you go, a few. And uh, again, a small detachment. We have four folks working in, in Prince George or PG. But when the doors open, 8.30 in the morning, we had three door crashers. Three door crashers. One, one fellow had uh, just been homeless. Family tossed him out. He was living in his truck. Uh, one veteran was a Korea War vet, wanted a reassessment. And the third one was a 95-year-old Royal Canadian Air Force veteran, World War II air crew, and it was living on his own on 200 acres, two-hour two drive north of Prince George, no electricity, no running water. So he comes into the office on this day one and the case manager of Veterans Service Agent says, whatever can we do for you? He says, I don't need nothing. I just want to know you guys are here when they take away my driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is important. Again, you know, we serve about 120,000 veterans, but the country has over 600,000 veterans. And a lot of veterans, their well-being is fine. On their own, they are happy. And I still remember it was almost five years ago when in Ottawa, there was a gentleman, his name was Mr. Cote, Mr. Cote, Lieutenant Colonel, Service Corps, landed in the Normandy beaches, okay? After the war, became a public servant, became a deputy minister, and a deputy minister in six departments including Veterans Affairs. And Mr. Cote was living on his own, 100 years old, on the east side of Ottawa, in Vanier, when there was a break and enter and someone came into apartment, his apartment and tried to kill him. And this 100-year-old veteran fought him off and survived to call it into 911 and didn't they catch the culprit? And the guy was quite the murderer. And we rolled in and say, Mr. Cote, what can we do to help you? He said, back off. <laughs> he said, I'm good. I don't need any help. Oh. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. We need to be there no matter where people are, whether it be here in Toronto or in Ottawa or up in Iqaluit or anywhere across the country. Uh, but at the same time, respect the fact if they've got everything in place, and their well-being is assured, march on. Mike, are you there for a reason? Yeah, I'm getting closer, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm getting closer there, to you, sir. Is there a red light up here? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much, Mike. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.